Cameroonian literature, especially Cameroonian literature in English, has come a long way. Authors over the years have long since explored themes surrounding community and culture and drawn on deeply personal experiences to truly capture local life. Many of these authors have gone on to achieve great success, while others remain criminally underrated. Uh, though considered minority literature, the products of Anglophone literary players have gone a long way to shape the social fabric of Cameroon, raising awareness on pressing issues. In this edition of the program, we explore the place of literature in a highly complex dispensation and how Cameroon literature in English can contribute in tackling prevailing local and global challenges. This is Hard Talk. <music> Our guest in this edition of the program is a poet, actress, creative writer, and associate professor of English at the University of Hartford, Connecticut, in the United States of America. She has appeared as an invited poet uh, in uh, some countries across the world. Her first book of poetry, A Basket of Flaming Ashes, was published to great acclaim. She has also contributed to several international anthologies of poetry, including Dhaka Anthology of World Poetry, Reflections, an anthology of New York by African women poets. We, we have crossed many rivers, new poetry from Africa, and World Poetry Almanac of the year 2011. A graduate of schools on three continents, Dr. Ash, as she is fondly called, received a Bachelor of Arts in English with a minor in theater arts from the University of Yaoundé in Cameroon, a master's in, in literary and information science from the University of Aberystwyth in the United Kingdom, and a PhD in English as well as African literature from the City University of New York. Her poems have been translated into Spanish, Greek, Hebrew, Turkish, as well as Bengali. Dr. Joyce Ashutang Tang, welcome to the program. Welcome to the program. Uh, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Yeah, the pleasure is shared. Yeah, here. the pleasure is shared here. Now, uh, let's now, get uh, uh, let's straight. Get, uh, the world uh, seems to be at crossroads. A uh, pandemic in Cameroon, the unrest in the Anglophone regions of Cameroon, democracy in Africa, in America challenged. Scientists who are looking to come up with, the, with vaccines and better therapeutics. What has literature got to do with everything happening? Uh, around us at this point in time? Our literature has everything to do with it. Our literature is used to calibrate our world. Literature is what we use to get to that human ideal that we never, we've not succeeded to attain. Uh, human beings tell stories, write poems, to understand, uh, to understand the world, to solve the problems of the world. And so, yet yeah, literature has everything uh, to do with it. That is why a lot of times literature gets there before the real world catches up. That is why uh, a Shakespearean uh, uh, play will still have relevance uh, today. The situation happening in, uh, in, in the US with the president seeming as if it's delusional somebody will say okay um uh, this is like king Lear, you know and um the book 1984 so many things in that book by george orwell seem to be repeating uh, repeating themselves i look at um during the american election when i notice christians in nigeria marching in support of Donald Trump right here in, um, in, in the United States. Guess what came to mind? I thought of Oberica in Things Fall Apart when he said the white man is clever. He came peaceably with his uh, religion. We were amused at his foolishness and allowed him to stay. Now he has put a knife to the things that held us together and we have fallen apart. That is a novel that was written in 1958 speaking to us in 2020. Literature got everything to do with it. Now, in the year 2008, now, the year 2008 on the 50th anniversary of uh, the fame Things Fall Apart, you interviewed uh, the legendary author Chinua Achebe. And last year, you also interviewed Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie in a solid 
uh, in a sold out event, uh, you have also had the opportunity of meeting Ngoki Nwachiogo Wole Soyinka and other legendary figures like Odume Dukwo Ojoku. What impact has that had on you as an Anglophone Cameroon writer? I would say that m uh, most of those um, names you've called, those are my idols growing up as a literary uh, a student, maybe except Ojuku, who is a political uh, uh, a figure. And um, each encounter validated me as an uh, Anglophone Cameroon writer. I also had an opportunity to discuss with them, to understand the the place of anglophone cameroon which i remember asking achebe about uh china achebe about the place of an anglophone cameroon writer sandwiched between populous nigeria and uh, uh francophone cameroon and i i was um kind of lamenting the fact that it is very it has been difficult to find that voice to to speak with these uh, two popular uh, regions uh, sandwiching us. And his answer was uh, quite uh, illuminating. And uh, this, is, this, this is what he, he, he said. He, he's like, that fact that you are sandwiched between these two uh, giants, so to speak, in, in terms of population, that is your story. That, that feeling of being being pressed down that minority uh, status that is your story when you hear that from um, a person like uh, uh, achebe you get in in inspired then you realize that he wrote as a nigerian as an Igbo, and he found his voice and each writer just has to write from their own place uh confidently when I met uh, Ngugi Wathiongo, it was the same thing. In fact, we had such a, such a fun time because he had fond memories of the Cameroon writer Belasone de Poco. They were close friends at the time uh, when Belasone de Poco was in France. And you take an example of Ngugi. When he came on the scene, he was the first uh, uh, Kenyan or East African of repute you know, that we read in school and, and, and stuff. And he did not hold back his story. He did not try to be an Achebe. He was in Ngugi, writing from the Kenyan experience. And so meeting these people is, uh, has been inspiring and has validated Anglophone Cameroon lit literature. Because when I, I talk with them, I realize that, hey, my voice counts as well. And as for Odemogu Ojuku, it was very interesting meeting him. Why? Because as an Anglophone Cameroonian, his activities marked my sense of identity. At the University of Yaoundé, when I, w I went uh, to the university, for the first time, I was labeled Le Biafran. You know, I'm a, Bia a Biafran. And this is the man who had declared Biafra as a state. And so it was interesting to meet him because uh, he did not realize that that action became an identity marker for me a, as a minority in, 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 in Cameroon. And so that gave me an opportunity to, to, to have that discussion and to see how time plays certain things are out. Okay, now, to what extent is the canonization of um, African literary works influenced by colonization? And can anything be done to reverse the trend? Uh, of course, uh, the canonization of uh, African literature has been influenced by colonization because most of the well-known literary texts were published by multinational, uh, multinational corporations. And these books were published in the West, were disseminated in the uh, in the West, and so most of the books that are known that won awards and continue to win awards are the works that are are published outside and well known outside, and so definitely there are marks of colonialism written all over all over that. Uh, some of our writers in uh, in different parts of uh, of Africa are not known. 
because they are published locally and are not disseminated widely. So uh, definitely, the when we look at what we call the canon of African uh, literature, you would definitely see um, marks of colonialism, definitely. Okay, now okay. you recently uh, co-edited a momentous book with a uh, distinguished poet and scholar, um, uh, Tanyue Ujaide, published by the highly rated Rudlesh Publishers. The Rudlesh uh, Handbook of Minority Discourses in African Literature. How did this project uh, come about? And tell us how Anglophone literature is situated in it. Um, the Handbook of uh, Minority Discourses in African Literature is definitely a momentous undertaking. Uh, uh, Professor Tamara Jaide, distinguished scholar with over 18 books of uh, poetry to his uh, credit, is from the Delta State in Nigeria. And so he is a minority within Nigeria. And as you know, the Delta State is the region where most of the oil in Nigeria comes from, but they, they have not benefited from, uh, from the oil that comes from that region. It is because of that fight that Ken Saro Wiwa, who is from uh, Ogoni, from the Del Delta State, was killed uh, with uh, eight others. So when I met Professor uh, Tanro Jaide, I talked about Anglophone Cameroon literature. Of course, he was aware of Anglophone Cameroon literature and had uh, actually met uh, Bate Bisong a couple of uh, times, was familiar with Bate Bisong's uh, work. So we started talking about our minority literatures, our minority position within the larger uh, nation state in his case, nation state Nigeria, in my case, nation state Cameroon. And um, so we came up with this idea that in, in, it is time for us to bring this minority literatures uh, together in a, in a shared uh, space and to put our local literatures within that framework of minority literature. So for me, it is a progression of my uh, studies on Anglophone Cameroon literature. I have been looking at these works uh, individually, uh, collectively, but I thought, okay, it is time for me to view them within the framework of minority literatures. They exist all over the world. Eritrean literature uh, is a minority uh, literature. The literature of uh, blacks in North, North uh, America is a minority literature. You have the Casamans region. So you have different regional literatures that so far, this minority status that Anglophone Cameroon literature uh, suffers. So it was um, very uh, productive to bring Cam Anglophone Cameroon literature within this uh, 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 framework. And going forward, that's something that I would uh, be doing uh, more to see what are these, uh, what are the various ways that this. Uh, literature are being framed, you know. So, and again, this is one um, way of making Anglophone Cameroon literature visible, you know, by bringing it into a, um, a momentous work like this, published by, in fact, Groudlich is the best uh, <laughs> publisher out there right now <laughs> in terms of re re reputation and what they put out. So, to have myself as an editor of this kind of work and Anglophone Cameroon literature is showcased within that it is um it's given it's going to give Anglophone Cameroon literature quite some uh, quite some visibility now doctor no, some no, critics no, argue no, that uh, no, trying no, to no, preserve no, an, an English literature in Cameroon distinct from the rest of the country um, is an insignificant move because it instead hampers the growth of uh, Cameroon Anglophone literature. Do you agree? Pick way of looking at Anglophone Cameroon literature. The, the fact that uh, Anglophone Cameroon writers are marking their literature as distinct doesn't mean that you're locking it in a box now. You're not. You're not locking it in a box. So it's uh, at some point, it is part of Cameroonian literature. It's just like uh, things fall apart. It's African literature. It's Nigerian literature. It's Igbo literature. 
So nothing stops Anglophone Cameroon literature from uh, having those uh, identity markers as well. It is Anglophone Cameroon literature. In another way, it is Cameroon literature. It is African literature. It is Black literature. So all those identity markers are relevant. So for, for me to mark it as Anglophone Cameroon literature doesn't mean that I'm taking away the other markers that open it up to, uh, to other uh, critical lenses. It's just like I just talked about uh, Anglophone Cameroon literature within African uh, minority, uh, uh, minority discourses in African literature. So you can put it in uh, different umbrellas, but the basic marker is that regional identity. So I, I, I don't, I don't uh, see it as an either or. Okay, now, okay, um, now one might be one might be forced to ask you as an advocate for um, Anglophone Cameroon literature. Uh, why does it matter? It, it's just like saying, why does your name matter? It's just like saying, why does your culture matter? Yeah. It's just like saying, why does your face matter? Why do you matter? Anglophone Cameroon literature matters because the people matter. This is a a, a, a literature that is marked by its regional status, the way the people live, the way they express themselves, you know, it is not, um, as you know, uh, Anglophone is relative. In Cameroon, it, it, it is not limited to English. An Anglophone is not someone who speaks English. No, the grandmother in Northwest or Southwest is Anglophone, even if she doesn't speak English. So it's an identity marker, it's an ethnic marker. So yes, literature from that region matters. It matters because it captures the, uh, the, the thoughts, it captures the culture, it captures the well-being of uh, the people of that region. It's not even a question. It matters because the people matter. Okay, C Cameroon has over 200 um, local languages, but they are being submerged and to an extent eroded by the official languages, which are English and French. How can poetry help in the preservation of uh, local languages? In, uh, interestingly, um, there's a lot that is being done these days to diversify. A lot of writers are beginning to write in their ethnic languages. I do. I, I'm, I write some poems in Kenyan. Uh, I know of Sam Mala who writes in Besa and um, Pidgin English. I also write in Pidgin English these days. You have um, Vakunta who has uh, published quite a couple of books. I think he has like two uh, books on, uh, on Pidgin. And um, so this is something that is being done. It's, it's uh, really unfortunate that something that started uh, very well, uh, the vernacular schools were, were squashed. But I know that many, there's an organization in Cameroon that has been fighting to bring these languages back because it's, it's very important. You know, there was a time that, uh, as you know, we, our local languages were being taught in school. You know, Douala in the Southwest was used, Douala was used in the Southwest and Mongaka in, in the North, Northwest. Uh, in fact, in, uh, in 1927, there were 299 vernacular schools teaching over 7,000 students. But by 1959, the number of vernacular schools had fallen to six. So this idea of uh, when Western education came, um, not Western, Western education, uh, education, when uh, the emphasis was now on English or French, then we lost, uh, we, we lost that. And that has affected even the sense of identity, affected uh, preservation of our own culture. Because as you know, language is not just uh, a means of communication, it's a carrier of culture. So if we are speaking in English, we are speaking in French, the truth about it is that we are not translating our culture, our history as forcefully as we would do if we were speaking our ethnic languages. Unfortunately, a lot of us don't really know it very well. So that's another thing. So 
uh, how can poets do to preserve uh, that lang language is by writing in them. And a few of us are doing that. But the majority can't even do that because they don't know those languages. The wonderful thing about it is that there's a resurgence of interest in our local ethnic languages, you know. And um, I see that this uh, tendency to learn the language, to write in it, is only going to continue. Okay, now, what are the appealing factors to the wedding of um, Anglophone Cameroon literature locally and even out of the country? And do you think that uh, something can be done to bring back the wedding culture in uh, Cameroonians? I would say that so many factors affect that. First of all, um, a lot of people associate reading uh, books, literary books, with school. Once they've left school, it's very difficult to find them just reading for, for pleasure because uh, it looks as if African literature is something to be studied and memorized to write exams. It's not something that you relax with, you know. So that is something that has to be changed. Then, of course, if reading was a problem in the past, it has become a bigger problem now with social media. And, uh, and movies and stuff. So another thing is that, uh, like to read a novel, you need space, you need a quiet, our homes are busy. So that, there's, there are many reasons why people don't, uh, uh, don't read. But I think also is that most people don't even understand, may, may not even know how enjoyable some of the works are. I know some people will say that, oh, like Anglophone Cameroon literature, they just think it's uh, all politics all the time you know so it looks as if it's something very serious all the time so you can relax with it but i think it's because they haven't taken the time to um to pick up a book and look into it some people will say the books are not available again that is uh, it's true to a certain ex extent some of the works that are published are ab abroad like uh, my Poetry collection, Beautiful Fire, or Bearing Witness. You can just go to the bookstore in Cameroon and see it. But then you have local uh, publisher, uh, local writers who are publishing right there. So if they want local books, they can get it. Uh, you know, so they, there's so many reasons that can impede. But I think I would say the biggest one is the will. Is the, is the will. Those who want to read are reading. And there's a lot of reading going on. I, I think we always, uh, we always look at the glass half empty than the glass half full. All right. Now, um, Cameroon literature in English is highly dominated by the male folks. We do have uh, Kenjo Jumba, Bati Bisong, Victor Epien, Gome, Bela Sone Dipoko and even uh, Bole Butake, who inspired you uh, so much. Uh, one may be tempted to ask if this is a fair assessment of uh, Cameroon literature in English. When it's a fair, a fair assessment, yes, most of the well-known writers have been, have been male. Uh, but there's, there are many women writing right now. There are many women. Uh, you named uh, 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 late Antony Tang, there's uh, Makuchi, Juliana Fahabeni. Uh, I uh, write, there's uh, Pat uh, Kweteyim. Um, now we have Mbolombwe, who is uh, living uh, in the USA, who has had uh, an award winning. Uh, uh, novel uh, Be behold the dreamers uh, i think that came out in 2017 or 2016 and she has another another one coming out she's a mega uh a mega writer so there are many women uh we many women coming out but i i think that um i talked about the fact that some uh some of our potential readers may not know what they're missing maybe that's why they don't pick up uh, uh, a book so i let me share a couple of poems here from my own work and this is um this one is titled uh, something remained 
and I'm just I'm going to do uh, some poems on hum womanhood. Uh, a beautiful fire has three sections. The first uh, section is titled "Call Me Woman," and has uh, poems that have to do with uh, womanhood. And the second section, uh, uh, "Nuggets of Passion." And uh, the final section is uh, politics of being. So something remained. And um, this is for pregnant women who die from abuse and those that are living with the scars. I want to write a poem in anger, but I'm no poet, only a woman with a womb, a witness to my sister's pain. Her dying sounds finding my beleaguered ear, not for me, not just for me. Leave me to breathe life in this sacred shrine. But blood stains opened a path for her. Her womb ran on legs of faith, violent steps encircled her light. Other body parts struggled for life. And death gathered them all in its hands, except her womb slippery with life. She's gone now. But her bloody stains scream on the sleeves of your shirt. They cry in the armpits of your public face. And flowers of her agony bloom in your sleep. No one wrestles with a god and wins. Every woman with a womb is a god. I would do another one. Did you hear that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. good poems. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. And um, this one, I I had fun with it. It's titled uh, "My New uh, Husband," and I I play with some of the expectations and uh, and stereotypes of womanhood here. This evening, I told my new husband I will come to bed by 9 p.m. to spread the table for a long nightly feast. I will banish night clothes from my closet. I will be Eve without the apple, a human body in his garden waiting for a holy harvest. This evening, I told my new husband no more traveling to conferences, seeking knowledge beyond his brain. My travels will be limited to where his driving takes me. Stuck by his side, I will prove I was taken from his rib. This evening, I told my new husband I will waste no time in taking his name and tame the urge to self-identify. As for children, I give up my womb. He is our kid for life. But it's 2 a.m. I realize I'm writing another poem. Wow, fantastic wow, poems. Fantastic. All right, let's uh, move on. Now, the award-winning uh, Jewish poet, Amy Oz, states, and I quote, that uh, Joyce Ash is a poet whose every movement into language challenges us out of our sentimental approaches to living. The veteran Nigerian poet Tanu Ojaide says that uh, Josh Ash gathers images into a honeycomb that the readers taste and keeps on devouring its sweetness. Chinere Okafo of Women's Studies, Wichita University on her part, writes that Ashun Tang Tang is an extraordinary weaver of words who showcases vivid pictures that complete that competes with 3D uh, simulations. Now, how do you use uh, language in your poetry? I'm fascinated with language. I remember my entrance into poetry came through the way I use language. I I was speaking with another veteran poet, uh, Neo Shundere. And he said, you speak poetry. You should publish poetry. And he said, maybe because that's the way you speak, you don't realize that it is, um, it is extraordinary. I love playing with words. I, I love um, using similes, metaphors, bringing nuances into words. Let me show you, um, showcase uh, one of my poems. Uh, it's a okay. short poem that people okay. people love. Talk to me, and you would. Uh, it's a play on language, and uh, I use the uh, the alphabet itself. You know. So yeah. let's see. Talk to me. Yeah. Um, in fact, let, let 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 me give a little background of this of this uh, uh, poem. Okay. This poem has to do with uh, communication, where I 
I was telling a friend of uh, mine who is a male poet that men don't communicate their, their feelings. And his response was that, oh, maybe women need to be smart to, they should be able to understand the way a man feels. You know, a, a woman who does not understand, uh, cannot understand the spouse or the lover's look, that woman has a problem because sometimes men don't talk because they believe that it is obvious. Anyway, I wrote this poem in response to that. Talk to me. I understand the language of your body, the verbs of your fingers, the nouns of your look, but talk to me tonight. Dress me up in capitals, lowercase me in song, string your letters like beads, adorn my waist in words, tongue your vowels on my bosom, tickle my brain with consonants, cool your heat in syllables. Talk to me tonight. So if, if I was still uh, to, to, to look at that, I, I enjoy um, playing with those uh, metaphors, the verbs of your fingers, the nouns of your look, and uh, it's like a game to me. And that's why I enjoy poetry, because you can say so much by, by juxtaposing uh, things, uh, stringing your letters like beads. You know, the African, traditional African woman wore beads around their waist. And so it's very easy for me with a play on language to be cultural, to bring in my uh, cultural identity uh, markers and at the same time be sensuous in the way I present, uh, in the way I present and use the language. <laughs> wow. I must say, I myself, I'm enjoying uh, some of those poems, and um, it's great uh, listening to you. Now, uh, Doc, do you think that the literary works of Cameroonians uh, abroad, particularly th those from the Northwest and Southwest regions, are visible and are being received uh, satisfactorily back at home? I think we just touched, uh, touched on that uh, uh, qu question. Uh, yes, to a certain extent, because of uh, social media, a lot of us uh, do programs here and there that are uh, broadcast on social media, so they get to listen to us, hear us, but uh, we're still having uh, problems with the physical books published, those published in the diaspora should be available in Cameroon. Um, uh, Spears Media that recently published uh, Bearing Witness, and I think is... Um, an upcoming uh, publisher of uh, Cameroon, Anglophone Cameroon literature is doing quite a, a bit of work to make sure that the works are available. For example, we just published Bearing Witness here and uh, a couple of, uh, some of the books are already in Cameroon and he's already uh, strategizing to make sure that uh, the books can be found regularly there. This is a work in progress, making our works available in 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 Cameroon, but uh, thank God for um, the internet. Uh, thank God for technology. Uh, some of these works are uh, being made available electronically, so people can uh, can read them. But in terms of visibility, uh, let me talk about that. I I want to talk about visibility not just in Cameroon, but visibility in the world, which is something that has been was lacking. People did not know about Anglophone Cameroon literature. In fact, it was even difficult to, to showcase Anglophone Cameroon literature because a lot of times when uh, African writing uh, is, is being showcased, it is done in terms of nation states. So it uh, becomes tricky. Ang Anglophone Cameroon is not a nation state. So if you're doing Nigerian literature, uh, Ghanaian literature, and especially if this is in English. So a lot of times, Anglophone Cameroon was erased. Just like it was erased in the world, in literary circles, it was erased. And uh, there is the, uh, the case of um, Albert Gerard, who was writing uh, um, a major text in African literature called European Language Writing in Sub-Saharan Africa. And Cameroon was uh, o o omitted. Okay, th this, this was, he was uh, dealing with countries speaking English. Do you know what he did in order to make sure that Anglophone Cameroon did not miss out? 
he put Anglophone Cameroon as an addendum to Nigerian literature. And how was that received? That? How did um, actors like you receive it? Well, um, in a way, you, it was that that was good because um, at least the literature was published. But it was sad. It was sad that um, it could not stand on its uh, on its own because. It is a region. It's it's a region. You could not. It's not a nation. It's a nation state. But now, a lot of us are making it visible, like this uh, momentous work that we just published, the the handbook, uh, the Routledge handbook of minority uh, discourses in African literature. You have Anglophone Cameroon uh, li literature there. The there's a major work, the dictionary. This is I have it right here. I, uh, let's see. See, I have it right here. A Dictionary of Literary Biography, uh, volume 360, Contemporary African Writers. This is a major reference work in the library. Guess what? See, uh, see who is there. Let me show you. That's Batebison. I wrote the entry uh, uh, of Batebison in this major work. This is books that we used to go to the library and you look at and you only see people like Chinua Chebe, Wale Shainkas there and stuff. So in terms of uh, visibility for Anglophone literature, some of us have been doing a lot of work to bring it into conversation with other world literatures. So uh, visibility at home, yes, there's a visibility. Um, thank God for social media, for the internet, for electronic copies. Some of the works published here, the physical hard copy, it's difficult to get it uh, uh, home. So we hope that visibility in that regard can increase. But in terms of Anglophone Cameroon literature, visibility in the world, um, some of us have been taking it to different corners of, of the world. Whatever festivals have gone to Nicaragua, uh, Colombia, Greece, Bangladesh, I was supposed to go to Romania, and um, because of COVID, I didn't get to go. Uh, but every, a lot of us out here, we've become um, makeshift ambassadors for the, for, uh, for the literature and the country. Now, in one oh, of your books, in Landscaping, books, you lamented landscaping. that English Cameroon publishers do not take into account the business part of their production seriously. Um, has there been any improvement in the business part of um, Cameroon literature in English? that uh, uh, SPS Media is doing a phenomenal job uh, marketing uh, its, um, its writers. Um, I published A Beautiful Fire with SPS Media. They organized a book launch for me during the African Studies Association Conference uh, when my book was being launched at the University of Hartford. Uh, they made a poster, they published catalogs that showcase uh, their, their products. And um, they're just uh, all around doing a phenomenal job. And I, I know that uh, others that will come along would follow that. I want to uh, let you know that a lot of the publishers in Cameroon, the indigenous publishers, I applaud them for what they're doing. They're working with very um, little uh, resources. Most, most of them, I would not even consider them publishers. You know, they're printers because um, they don't have what it takes to do real publishing. Not that, not that they don't want to. The means, it's not there. This is a, a an area that is uh, demands heavy duty equipment. If you are going to get editors to read the works, you need to pay the editors. So to to do that marketing end is uh, it's challenging and difficult. And I know that some of them would want to do it, but the resources are not there. And that is why we those of us uh, who have published with PS Media are very excited that um, they're beginning to do the kinds of things that mainstream publishers do. They just produce their second uh, catalog, and it's it's fascinating. So yes, um, I can say that PS Media is doing that. You have been uh, living have been, and teaching uh, in the United teaching. States for uh, over twenty years. Tell us how this has. Uh, 
this has influenced uh, the, your concept of home? I want to uh, say that um, being abroad now for over 20 years has classified home in a way that I don't think home would have carried the weight it carries if I was back in Cameroon. When you are away, your sense of identity is sharpened, especially in a foreign land and especially in a country like America where race is a factor. When, before I got to America, I didn't bother about my being black. I didn't even know that I was black. <laughs> You know, I it, because it is not a it's not a, my it's not an identity marker in Cameroon, and um, and when I went to England, yes, I was a, it was there, but I was a student on campus. I didn't really have to deal with it. But when you live in America, you confront your sense of identity, and um, I have at this point I have adopted two homes, the United States. It's home for me. I I relate to to it in a very special way. I see myself as a, a descendant of the slaves who came and died here and sacrificed, hoping that someday their relatives like me would find out what happened to them. So I am here. I relate to the United States in that manner. It is home in that manner. But uh, home in Cameroon is a place that I hold dear. And uh, the recent uh, problems in Cameroon, the Anglophone crisis, has, uh, has been, how can I put it? It's been very sad to, to experience, to witness from a distance. And um, because of the place of home to me, I collaborated with uh, Dibusi Tande, um, the collection Bearing Wit Witness, you know, Bearing Witness, Poems from a Land uh, in Tumor. We brought together uh, 71 poets. It's a collaboration between poets in Cameroon and in the diaspora and um, had a collection of 101 poems that capture what is going on in our land uh back in uh, back in cameroon and um why did why did we decide to do this i would uh, just uh, maybe just read uh what we have here in the introduction to write is to confront to write is to remember to write is to resist. To write is to testify. To write is to heal. And so, um, home is a place that and uh, that holds our identity. That holds our future. And when that place is in turmoil, our lives are in turmoil. So, um, maybe to to show an example of that, I'll read my poem, um, if we have uh, time. It's called A Village in uh, Seven Vignettes. This poem, this was at the beginning of the crisis and my village was overrun. There was, um, you know, you sit here and you hear this news. All oh, the military are going to your village. They're going. The place is going to be burned down and stuff. And I was frightened. And uh, over the course of uh, a month, it's one news or the other. And so this is. Um, do we have time for this? Yeah, just go ahead. Yeah, just go ahead. Uh, we, we have just one, uh, have one just last one, question uh, before we go. So question. go ahead. Okay, no, okay, then this one I'll do, then I'll do a, a short, uh, a short poem. Right. And this has to do with, um, it's titled, it's, it's a question of time. You know, Cameroon used to be known as a very peaceful country. And uh, I used to pride myself living abroad saying, oh, we don't have those kind of problems in Cameroon. And it's, uh, it's amazing to see where we are now. And so this, this poem captures that. It was a question of time. 
Africa has been riddled with avoidable wars. From Biafra to Kabinda, the embers are not dead. From Liberia to Sierra Leone, the nightmare was real. From South Sudan to Congo, peace is still a dream. Cameroon was never that Africa. The triangle cradled fragile peace as Anglophones push the force of argument, hoping for reason to block barrels of gun. Today, Cameroon makes the list. Cries of Watana Wata gauge bullets mid-air. Gruesome photos of dead bodies abound, and refugees cross borders of spirits and earth. Displaced from our place of innocence, women are trapped in bushes, stuffing moss for parts. Children out of school use blood to write their names. Graves are overrun with grass and abandoned bones. They cannot say they did not see this coming. They cannot say we were not a sleeping volcano. They cannot say our blood is not on their heads. 56 years and counting, it was a question of time. I must say that was um, a very, very uh, great poem there. Now, um, you are one of the household names as far as African literature and Cameroon literature in particular is concerned. Um, what drives the work of uh, Dr. Joyce Anshu Tang Tang? Wow, <laughs> interesting question. What drives my work? It's my identity as a woman, identity as a black person, identity as uh, Anglophone Cameroonian, identity as Cameroonian, um, identity as African, and my identity as a human being. Like I said before, uh, literature helps to calibrate the world. And so I use uh, my writing to calibrate my world, to engage with my world, to understand uh, my world. So I don't write to publish. I write because I cannot help writing. When I am happy, I respond in writing. When I'm sad, I respond in writing. It is the way I try to understand my, uh, my world. So my writing is uh, fueled by my living, <laughs> so, so, so to speak. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get you. And uh, that uh, does it for uh, this edition of the program. I want to thank you very much for being with us, despite uh, all the uh, difficulties that we had. Thank you very much, Doctor. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for, uh, for, for reaching out. And um, it was a pleasure. And of it course, yeah, we we'll promise you that we can get you uh, some other times. And particularly, I must say that uh, those poems were uh, very, very uh, enticing. K keep on. Yes, I would love to be back and to talk about uh, other things outside uh, literature. <laughs> of course. <laughs> like I always tell my students, I know a little bit about the world too. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay then. <so. laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Doctor. And to you, so uh, Televirus, it was a pleasure being with you in this edition of the program Hard Talk. Until next week, bye-bye.